This video covers the positioning of the mandible. It should be watched after having first viewed the three preceding videos, which looked at the cranial vault, the facial bones, and the sinuses. After this video, there is a PDF presentation which describes some of the pathologies, particularly fractures, which can readily occur within the facial bones and mandible, and I encourage you to have a look at that non-narrated presentation. The mandible is a potentially challenging area to perform radiography on because it's superimposed by many other structures and it's a curved structure. It can be very challenging to, to see fractures of this region. As such, uh, there are some projections which can be utilized on the mandible, but probably the only one which is utilized very frequently is the PA mandible amongst the plane radiographic projections. The PA mandible projection can be undertaken a number of different ways. Essentially, the purpose of this projection is to be able to elongate the mandible maximally so that any fractures can be seen without any superimposition and any fractures which have a displacement mediolaterally can be seen readily. As such, while there are a number of different ways to perform this projection, the technique which I advocate for you here should have the best chance of being able to show any fractures. For the PA mandible projection, the common information is that the orbitomiatal line should be horizontal. That is that the uh, forehead is tucked in so that the patient's nose and forehead is against the image receptor and the interpupillary line should be horizontal. When we undertake those two things, you can see that the primary beam should be uh, able to elongate that mandibular structure. I do not advocate a tube angulation for mandibular projections. Now, the intention of this projection is to have the divergent ray cutting through the mandibular angle and elongating the entirety of the mandible. That is the intention here. So a PA mandible projection requires for the orbitomiatal line to be horizontal and the interpupillary line to be horizontal. There should be no tube angulation and the centering point should be in the mid-sagittal plane at the level of the mid-mandibular angles. The head is positioned such that the patient's nose and forehead is against the image. You should collimate superiorly to include the entirety of the external auditory meatus, which is the patient's ear hole level, and all the way down to the patient's mental symphysis, and both of those surface anatomy structures should be well known to you. When you perform this projection, which is on a 24 by 30 portrait with about 75 kbp, you should end up with a projection which looks like this. Now, as you can see, if that the mandible has been elongated, and if there is a fracture, hopefully there won't be any superimposition of the proximal and distal fragment sections over each other, so you should be able to see that fracture. We should be able to see almost all of the mandible. Certainly the superiormost parts at the temporomandibular joints are going to be superimposed by the lower part of the facial bones and the, the temporal constructs, and certainly the medial aspect, that is the midline mental symphysis aspect is going to be superimposed over the cervical spine. However, we should be able to see the entire mandible even with some superimposition. Assuming that the mandible is a symmetrical structure and it can be displaced somewhat by fracture, um, we should be able to see that mandible as a fairly symmetrical structure. So we've performed our PA mandible. The next views that you do really depend upon the facilities available to your particular imaging center. The OPG or orthopantomogram is a very good projection for the mandible, but it requires specialized equipment and not all centers have access to it. As such, it's important to be able to describe some of the other projections as well. The lateral mandible tends to be undertaken reasonably infrequently.
when a patient has got a queried mandibular fracture, superimposing uh, the two mandibular sides over each other doesn't really clarify the situation. If anything, it probably makes it a little bit more challenging. However, to perform a lateral mandible projection uh, requires for the head to be in a true lateral position. And as I've discussed in previous videos, having the patient positioned in approximately a 45 degree rotation of their thorax such that then their head is turned and in a true lateral position is the best way to position these. The interpupillary line should be a horizontal structure and the central ray passes through the mid mandible and by mid mandible what I mean is essentially a point halfway between the mental symphysis and the external auditory meatus. That lateral mandibular projection should have a 24 by 30 landscape or portrait image receptor. It doesn't really matter too much, but I tend to go with landscape. And it really does um, require for the patient to really have that sort of, once again, that shoulder and neck in close to the image receptor. When performed well, it should look something like this. And you can see that there is almost complete superimposition of structures such as the mandibular angle and mandibular rami. The mandibular condyles and the petrous temporal bones aren't perfectly superimposed because they are a more peripheral structure on this image. Lateral mandible and or lateral facial bones can be undertaken with a special um, form of lateral imaging of the facial bones called lateral cephalometry, which basically uh, puts the patient's head into a clamp-like device, which means that the patient will be in a true lateral position, but it can be performed quite readily just with standard radiographic positioning. So we should have superimposition of bilateral structures, we should see the entirety of the mandible, and it should be very close to a true lateral projection. If you do not have access to an OPG, but there is a query or suspicion of a fracture around the mandibular ramus and angle, then the axiolateral projections can be useful. The first axiolateral projection I'd like to talk about is for the TMJs. And an axiolateral projection is essentially one which introduces an angle to a patient in approximately a lateral position. If you wanted to have a look at the patient's temporomandibular joints, an OPG or lateral cephalometry is the ideal projection. However, without having access to those, if you wanted to see whether or not the patient had a disruption to their temporomandibular joints or TMJs, then the axiolateral projection is what you do. Starting off with the patient in a true lateral position, what you're going to do is instead of having the central ray be a horizontal structure, you are going to introduce an angulation such that the central ray passes through the TMJ closest to the image receptor. Now often what this means is first of all having a practice run, sitting or standing the patient against the erect bucky and then assessing the level of their temporomandibular joints, their ear hole level, so that you can ensure that your uh, image receptor is at the correct level. Then introducing about a 25 degree chordate angulation such that it strikes the image receptor at that height. Then bring the patient back in and position them in a true lateral position. And you should end up with the superimposition of the target temporomandibular joint over the parietal bone on the non-affected side. So hopefully that smooth plate-like bone of, for example, in this image, the patient's left parietal bone will be superimposed over the TMJ and you should see that target TMJ quite well. So the axiolateral TMJ projection is a true lateral with the affected side touching the image receptor, but a 25 degree chordate angulation hitting that target TMJ passing through the parietal bone on the other side. Depending upon the queried pathology, it might be performed with the patient's mouth open or closed or still or an open and closed series if you were querying something such as a temporomandibular joint dislocation or subluxation. This patient 
is having a axiolateral TMJ projection with an open mouth. This photograph shows a tube angulation of 30 degrees. I don't think 30 degrees is necessary. 20 to 25 should be all you require because all you're really trying to do is to project that temporomandibular joint above the rest of the bones of the base of the skull. So 30 degrees is a bit too much there. And we should end up with something like this. Hopefully you can see the socket there of the temporomandibular fossa and hopefully you can see the mandibular condyle. Now in this projection, these two projections, we have both an, a closed and an open projection. When the patient's mouth is open or when your mouth is open, your mandible moves inferiorly and anteriorly such that that condyle will then move against that process just anterior to the temporomandibular fossa. An axiolateral TMJ projection is commonly, very commonly performed bilaterally. And so you may end up doing open and closed left, open and closed right to be able to, to show that TMJ functionality. The axiolateral mandible is probably one of the most difficult projections to describe. Rather than go straight into the positioning of this projection, I'd instead like to tell you the objective, and that will hopefully clarify why we are doing this projection and how we do it. The image in front of you shows a young lady who is having some x-rays done of her mandible. Perhaps she's not a suitable candidate for an OPG, or perhaps we don't have access to an OPG machine. But we have a query of a possible fracture of the mandibular ramus or angle. For that reason, axiolateral mandible projections can be performed. Now these can be performed with the patient supine, as was the way this photograph was originally taken, or erect, and that's the way that I've actually just rotated this photograph. Now, in this photograph, we have the patient's right side being closest to the image receptor, and we are imaging the right-hand side. The purpose of this projection, this photograph in front of you, is to try to get the majority of the right side of the patient's mandible in contact with the image receptor and parallel with the image receptor. It's not a true lateral projection you can see that we have got a cephalad angulation. The purpose of that cephalad angulation is to project the patient's left mandibular ramus and angle superiorly and out of the way. The right side is the area of interest on this projection. Now, you'll notice that I have not stated a particular tube angulation at this point. The purpose of this projection is to separate the mandibular angles and rami. To achieve that, we have an approximately 30 degree cephalad angulation. That 30 degree cephalad angulation can be achieved by a 30 degree tube angulation, a 30 degree tilting of the head to the side, or any combination of those two angles to create the sum of 30 degrees. So I will be describing this as though the patient's head is tilted 15 degrees on their side and with a 15 degree tube angulation. But the important message is this, Tube angulation plus head tilt equals 30 degrees. There is an additional positioning rotation to describe as well. But if you are mindful of the fact that this mandible, the right hand side of this patient's mandible needs to be parallel to and closely as close as possible to in contact with the image receptor, we'll be able to understand this projection. We start off with the patient in approximately a lateral position. We then have the patient turn their head 
toward the image receptor. So the patient, if you were to have a look at the patient's eyes, they are not looking straight ahead, but rather their head has been turned 15 degrees toward that image receptor. If you were to feel your own mandible now, you could obviously feel that it starts out as a broad structure near your ears and tapers into the midline. By turning the head towards one side, we bring the majority of that mandibular structure parallel with the long axis or parallel with the plane of the film. After we have rotated the head, we also then tilt the head such that it plus the tube angulation equals 30 degrees. So I've mentioned 15 degrees there. However, it is part of your total angulation. Often having a small sponge underneath the patient's neck and mandible may assist so long as it's not going to cause an artifact. So the head is turned into the image receptor and the mandible is slightly away from the image receptor, but the forehead is tilted closer in. That will separate the left and right mandibular rami. So 15 degree head rotation, 15 degree head tilt, 15 degree tube angulation, but functionally the head tilt and angulation equals 30 degrees. Now, if you're able to achieve that, this is what you should end up with. A position where the patient is off lateral, that is that their head is not in a true lateral position. It's 15 degrees turned into the erect bucky or table bucky. And it is also uh, angulated such that the top of the head is closer in towards the film. The forehead is closer. So the interpupillary line will be on a 15 degree angle is another way of considering it. The tube angulation plus that head tilt equals 30 degrees. The centering point is going to be in the target mandibular body. So the central ray is going to pass essentially uh, just anterior to the mandibular angle and at the midpoint between those two mandibular angles. It can be done erect or supine, and you can see that this is one way of performing the projection. It does distort the image a little touch, so I would prefer to have the image receptor be flat, but it's not a bad way of positioning it. This is what you should end up with. It's actually a very, very pretty projection once it's performed well. You can see on this particular projection that the entirety of the patient's mandibular condyle, angle, ramus and body almost all the way up to the mental symphysis can be projected clear of any of the rest of the skull and the rest of the uh, mandible the the target side is shown well but the non-target sides projected way off the top of the image you will get some superimposition over hyoid bones and things like that that's very very normal and so in terms of the criteria, we should show the mandibular condyles off the cervical spine so we can see that condyle and that that target region, the affected side of body, ramus, mandible can be seen maximally. Once we get into the curvature of the patient's mental symphysis, we will, the, the uh, anatomy will be distorted, of course. We'll perform this projection bilaterally to show both sides because we are going to be very likely to have multiple fractures over the mandible. And now the orthopantomogram. The principle of an orthopantomogram is to only expose a small area of the image receptor at one particular time, and that over that exposure, and as we expose segment by segment of the image receptor, the entirety of the x-ray tube and image receptor rotate around the patient. Subsequently, we should end up with a curved structure of the mandible being shown as a flat structure across the plane of the image receptor. OPG positioning is something which is frequently done quite poorly. There are a number of things that I'd like you to be aware of. First of all, communicate with your patient. Try to get all metallic foreign bodies out of the way. Earrings, 
nose piercings, other facial piercings, false teeth, things like that should be taken out of the possibility of causing an artifact. On the image in front of you there, you can see in that photograph that the model is biting onto a small piece of plastic that is essentially between her teeth. This is the most correct bite device to use. If you have been on placement and have seen an OPG, you may have seen some which have got this bite device, some which use like a tray that the mandible slides into, or probably both, and for most machines it's an interchangeable thing. Ideally, you should, wherever possible, utilize the bite piece. It will have a groove in the top and bottom to allow for the top and bottom teeth to be in the same plane, and so you're going to end up with a sharper image of the teeth. In addition, while it is less fun to bite on something to just rest your chin in a slot, it will have a, a better image quality and it does mean that the patient's less likely to turn their head, which is the case when you use the tray. The patient is placed in the OPG machine after you've removed all of the foreign bodies and things like that. Communicate well with your patient and let them know that the machine is going to take 10 seconds, it's going to make noise. And most particularly, and this is very, very important for broader shouldered patients, let them know that if the machine brushes up against their shoulders, that they are to try to stay as still as they can and to let it move around them. The patient will bite onto the bite piece or as necessary, slide their chin into that mandibular tray and a rest is going to be placed against the forehead and possibly some clamps against the side of the head as you can see in this photograph with the intent of keeping the head absolutely still. The orbitomeator line should be horizontal, and so this photograph, the chin is tilted up a little bit too far. I would have liked to have seen the chin down a little touch more. The patient's shoulders should be relaxed. Now, in this particular photograph, this model is, is a slim shouldered lady. However, one of the things that you can do is to wrap your arms underneath that bar that you can see in front of the patient and so the left hand holds on to the right bar and vice versa. That will then bring the shoulders anteriorly and medially and that should allow for uh, the tube to move around the patient with a little bit more comfort and less uh, safety issues. The head should be vertical, the vertical line should be running straight down their face and these OPGs can be performed in a, with a patient in a chair, and that's fine, particularly if you've had a patient who's had an assault or something like that, and uh, you want to make sure that they're not a fainting risk, but really you should be assessing your patient for their ability to comply. If you use a chair, do not use a rotating chair, because if the tube hits the patient's shoulders, that rotating chair is just gonna rotate the patient around as well, okay? So use a chair with fixed legs. Tell that patient to stay nice and still, not to turn their head, and what you should end up with is a nice, gentle OPG. Now, when performed well, um, the, the standard positioning doesn't really apply for the OPG because you can't change the angle. It's an image receptor specialized for the purpose or indeed a DR OPG machine. Um, and the central ray, of course, well, it's going to go all the way around that patient. So it's going to be at approximately the level of the, the mid mandible. You should have that interpupillary line horizontal. The, the mirror in front of the patient should have uh, lines etched into it to enable you to know if the patient's in a true uh, interpupillary line being horizontal position. When the projection has been performed <coughs> and the orbitomeator line is horizontal, you should end up with the image that you can see in the middle of the screen there. If the patient's chin is too far forward, or the head has been tilted too far back, you're going to end up with a much more easily performed OPG because the head's up nice and high, but it's not going to get the majority of those facial bones structures, those mandibular structures in the same plane. So it's gonna be out of focus. Similarly, if you have got the chin too far back, the forehead too far forward, you're once again going to project structures 
outside of that plane of focus. And so once again, you're not going to be able to see good detail of all of the teeth and mandibular structures. So when an OPG has been performed well, the patient's bite plane, that is the alignment of their upper and lower teeth should be in a slight smile. And the image in front of you in the middle of screen represents the ideal curvature of the bite plane. If you've got a flat bite plane, like the image on the top of the screen, that looks like they've got an angry mouth, you've got the chin too far forward. You need to bring the forehead more forward. And conversely, if you've got that very, very exaggerated, huge smile that you can see down the bottom, the chin is too far back. You really need to bring that chin forehead, chin forward and forehead back. The OPG is one which really does require a fair amount of compliance, but it is a, a very, very good projection for being able to show the entirety of the mandible as one structure. It is not the be all and end all of radiography of the mandible. You still do need a supplementary projection such as the PA mandible, uh, a complementary projection, I should say, so as to be able to show any displacement of fragments. Um, the OPG always suffers from the fact that it in the midline it's going to be superimposed over the c-spine so you may have some compromised image quality there if you have any questions about any of the positioning of the cranial vault please do jump onto discussion board otherwise i encourage you to have a look at the final pdf file which outlines the uh, common pathologies of the cranial vault and facial bones and good luck with your studies